All right, welcome and good evening. Um, my name is Samir Gandesha, and I'm the director of the Institute for the Humanities here uh, at Simon Fraser University. Uh, I'm also the full professor of uh, Golby Humanities, um, also at SFU. Um, gives me um, tremendous pleasure to welcome you to this um, uh, evening uh, discussion of the war in Ukraine um, by uh, good friend and esteemed colleague, uh, James Horncastle. Um, before I go any further, though, I'd just like to acknowledge that uh, this event is taking place on the um, uh, unceded territories of the Coast Salish people, the Squamish Musqueam, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. Um, I would also just like to mention that we are um, just completing now our 40th uh, year. Our, we had our 40th anniversary. We have having our 40th anniversary this um, this year, and we had a rather large and I think quite a I hope what people consider to be a successful conference just a couple of weeks ago um, celebration, and we look forward to. Uh, to many more decades um, uh, in, into the future. Um, I would encourage people, if they haven't already signed up for our email list, to do so and to be you know, kept apprised of uh, future events, which you know, we're very much looking forward to. Um, so without uh, any further ado, I, I'd just like to um, introduce Professor um, James Horncastle who was born and raised in New Brunswick, Canada. After attending St. Thomas University, um, inspired by its emphasis on liberal and arts education, um, he applied to do uh, uh, graduate work, his master's at the University of New Brunswick, uh, examining the social and political and military uh, dimensions of Yugoslavia's collapse in the 1990s. Upon the completion of his master's, um, he went on to do um, a PhD here at SFU. Um, and as part of his PhD, he examined the Macedonian question in the Greek Civil War. After s first serving um, as a limited term appointment here at SFU, uh, which lasted three years, um, he joined the Hellenic Studies program as the inaugural holder of the Edward and Emily McQuinney professor, professorship in international relations. Um, before you join me in welcoming um, Professor Ron Castle, I should just make a note um, that the, the event was billed as um, both a lecture and then a, a conversation between the two of us, but because of um, events out of my control, um, I think we're just going to have the, the lecture and then we'll open up for Q&A uh, and stick around for the reception. There'll be some food and a, and a cash bar and we'll have a more fulsome discussion um, following. Okay, well, please join me in welcoming Professor James Horncastle. Okay, before we get going here, just want to thank Samir for giving me the opportunity to talk, Pentea for organizing everything, and all of you for being here tonight. The Russia-Ukraine war, as the second year of the current phase draws to a close, remains a protracted conflict with no immediate end in sight. While there have been recent moves by nominal allies of Ukraine, most notably Slovakia, to withdraw the aid, there is as of yet no indication that aid from Ukraine's major supporters is evading. In the case of Russia, the failure of the Wagner Group's revolt this summer and subsequent purge of the military have, if anything, further solidified Putin's control of the country and his and the political establishment's desire to see the war through to a conclusion. With the autumn weather largely stabilizing the battlefront and allowing both sides to call up more reinforcements, now is an important time to examine how the conflict reaches point, the current problems faced by both Russia and Ukraine, and how Western aid is not proving decisive and where it may be going in the future. One of the problems in analyzing the origins of the Russia-Ukraine conflict is determining where to begin the analysis. Both sides have made extensive use of history to rally their respective bases, as well as demonize the opposing side. Russia's constant references to denazification, for example, are using selective tropes from the Second World War that resonate amongst the Russian populace. Canada, unfortunately, waded into these arguments when Parliament chose to honor a Ukrainian Canadian 
who had fought for the SS Galicia Division during the Second World War. While choosing any starting point is fraught with problems, the optimal place to start an analysis of the Russia-Ukraine conflict is the collapse of the USSR and the impact it had on Russian-Ukrainian relations. The 1990s were not kind to Russia. When the Soviet Union collapsed, the Russian nation lost its place at the center of one of the world's superpowers. While the Soviet Union was a multinational entity, it simultaneously was seen by many, including ethnic Russians themselves, as the heir of the Russian Empire and identity. So much was Russia's identity tied to the Soviet Union that whereas each of the republics within the USSR possessed their own national institutions, Russia did not. Instead, they possessed Soviet institutions. While some scholars argue has placed ethnic Russians at a disadvantage in the USSR, and this argument has certainly true under several of the USSR secretary generals, it simultaneously provided a means for Russians to associate Soviet success with their own. The collapse of the USSR caused the country to simultaneously face economic collapse, civil unrest, and loss of international respect. Russia, in the aftermath of the Soviet Union's collapse, experienced the full effects of shock therapy. Economic activity collapsed, mortality rates skyrocketed, and even former Soviet officials of good standing were not immune. Putin allegedly during this time was forced to take a job as a taxi driver. Perhaps most disconcerting for Russian nationalists was the fate of ethnic Russians outside the borders of the Russian Federation. Both state-driven policies, the USSR used ethnic Russians to help establish stability in republics where the loyalty was suspect, as well as individual economic opportunities, individual Russians could often achieve high positions in non-Russian republics, resulted in considerable movement of ethnic Russians beyond the borders of the Russian Soviet Socialist Republic. While the successor states pledged to respect the rights of ethnic Russian minorities, most of them failed to do so. For Russia, which went from being a superpower to not being able to protect ethnic Russians outside its borders in less than 10 years, this was a national embarrassment. Combined with their loss of status in the international community, United States and other powers effectively downplayed their suggestions and contributions in international crises, like the collapse of Yugoslavia, and resentment and loss of identity were reflected in Russian politics as it entered the new millennium. This takes us to the rise of Putin to power. Putin, in his 2000 presidential campaign, capitalized on this popular resentment over the alleged mistreatment of Russia and Russians internationally. Putin's campaign took very, specific, or very few specific policy stances beyond taking a hard line against Chechen separatists in the Second Chechen War. Instead, Putin appealed to the emotions and feelings of dislocation amongst the electorate. In a quote that summed up his campaign platform, Putin argued, quote, for the first time in the past 200 to 300 years, Russia is facing a real threat of sliding to the second and possibly even third echelon of world states. We must strain all intellectual, physical, and moral forces of the nation. Nobody will do it for us. Everything depends on us and us alone." End quote. Putin's appeal was in returning Russia to being a first-rate power, a great power. One of the key features of a great power is the ability to control and influence its immediate environment. For Putin and Russian nationalists, pivotal to this self-conception was their relationship with Ukraine. Russia's relationship with Ukraine in the immediate post-Soviet collapse, contrary to today's conflict, was remarkably strong. For nationalists from both countries, there have been tensions stretching back to the USSR and beyond. But the collapse of the Soviet Union provided the potential for both parties to reset their relations. Issues that had arisen in the past, such as the 1986 Chernobyl disaster, could instead be reinterpreted as being caused by the old Soviet guard that both countries replaced even if political officials in both countries still possess Soviet roots. Furthermore, strong economic ties had developed between the two republics during the Soviet Union, with Ukraine possessing both heavy industry and, more importantly, raw resources for the Russian economy. While Russia's economy declined significantly due to the collapse of the Soviet Union and shock therapy, this was doubly the case with Ukraine, which lost access to the internal markets of the former Soviet Union and found itself uncompetitive in the global market. The economic benefits of the relationship combined with strategic concerns of both parties, specifically regarding the Black Sea Fleet. The Soviet Union, under Secretary General Nikita Khrushchev, transferred Crimea to Ukraine in 1954. Crucially, Crimea and its major city of Sevastopol possessed the headquarters of the Black Sea Fleet. 
While the Black Sea Fleet fell under jurisdiction of Ukraine in 1991, most of its personnel preferred Russian sovereignty. Although the process was fraught with tension, Russia and Ukraine reached a temporary agreement on joint management of the fleet in 1995, and in 1997, formally divided the fleet while providing basin rights for the Russian Blackfeet until 2017. The Black Sea Fleet, in many ways, became a barometer of Russian-Ukrainian relations up until Russia's annexation of Crimea in 2014. The 2014 Revolution of Dignity fundamentally altered relations between Ukraine and Russia. Prior to this point, Russia had maintained strong relations with Ukraine, specifically through Ukraine's president, Yanukovych. Although the Ukrainian people deposed Yanukovych in the Orange Revolution of 2004, the weakness of the Yushchenko government that followed in its wake and its inability to deliver on the revolution's promises allowed Yanukovych to return to power in 2010. Yanukovych's blatant favoritism of Russia, he refused to sign a free trade agreement with the EU, and a strong suspicion that he was Russia's agent in Ukraine, Transparency International rated him the most corrupt politician in part due to his ties to Russia, caused the Ukrainian people to rise up against his government in 2013. Not shockingly, Yanukovych fled to Russia in the aftermath of the 2014 revolution. The aftermath of the revolution of dignity presented Russia with a problem. Ukraine, due to its geostrategic position astride major oil and gas lines, as well as possessing Crimea and the Black Sea Fleet, is arguably Russia's most important neighbor. Yanukovych's blatant uh, supplication before Russia, however, had turned popular sentiment in Ukraine against Russia. Russia's patronage of Yanukovych, ironically, helped create the seeds that Russia sought to avoid through said patronage, a Ukraine that increasingly questioned its relationship with Russia. For Russia, this was unacceptable on several grounds. First, Ukraine possessed a large ethnic minority, and a Ukraine that was potentially ambivalent challenged Russia's preeminence amongst its own people. This was particularly the case if Ukraine's pursuit of ties with Euro Europe elevated its economy and standard of living above that of Russia. Second, to be a great power, one must control one's immediate domain. The United States' rise to great power status, for example, was built on the principles of the Monroe Doctrine, whereby other powers could not interfere in the internal politics of the Americas. The United States' visceral reaction to the Cuban Missile Crisis, for example, is demonstrative of great power's reaction to perceived interference within their zones of influence. Ukraine's pursuit of the EU, and indirectly the United States due to their close ties, represented a fundamental challenge to Russia's neo-imperialistic policy. Lastly, potentially losing Sevastopol and the Black Sea Fleet would compromise its force projection capabilities. In the days after the Ukrainian people deposed Yanukovych, soldiers started appearing within Crimea. Although not displaying any official insignia, the Little Green Men, as they became known, appeared at a time when multiple elements of the Russian army went on vacation, their holiday destination being Crimea. Although contested, the ideological origins of the Wagner Group, if not their actual establishment, occurred concurrently with this development and would definitively be used in the Donbass in the coming months. On 27 February 2014, the Little Green Men seized Crimea, and on 17 March 2014, Russia formally annexed Crimea to the Russian Federation. Russia's annexation of Crimea was not the end of the conflict between Russia and Ukraine. Russia, taking advantage of the political chaos in the aftermath of the Revolution of Dignity, encouraged separatist parties in the Donetsk and Luhansk oblasts. Donetsk and Luhansk are the two oblasts in the Donbass, which in Russian nationalist rhetoric has been commemorated as the heart of the Russian state due to its importance in the Russian Empire and Soviet Union's industrialization. Furthermore, Due to the region's connections with Russia, significant Russian migrations over the 19th and 20th centuries had established ethnic Russian predominance in the region. Lastly, Yanukovych had actually cultivated this region's support as part of a divide and rule policy. As such, not only did Russia desire the region, but simultaneously they found fertile embers to stoke. The war in the Donbass started on 6 April 2014 and followed a similar playbook to Russia's annexation of Crimea. Russian-backed separatists seized government buildings and with the support of Russian military advisors, pushed back Ukrainian forces in the region. On 11 May 2014, both the newly declared Donetsk and Luhansk People's Republics 
held internationally condemned referendums of questionable integrity that were term results whereby approximately 90% in each of the self-declared states voted for independence. Just as a side note, if one is rigging an election, make the number believable. Unlike in Crimea, however, Ukrainian units were in a position to contest Russia's attempt to break Donetsk and Luhansk away from Ukraine. The additional time since the Revolution of Dignity had given time for both the Ukrainian state and the Ukrainian people to process Russia's machinations against their country. Furthermore, Crimea provided a clear example of what would happen if they did not act. Both Ukrainian regular and irregular units, including the inf infamous Azov forces, countered the advances of the Russian-backed separatist forces to the extent that in 24, August 2014, Russia was forced to remove the fig leaf of non-intervention and deployed their armed forces to directly support the Donetsk and Luhansk People's Republics. Although several ceasefires were reached, active combat threatened to spill over at any moment until Russia's full-fledged invasion of Ukraine in 2022. Russia, in many ways, created the very sector specter that it sought to avoid by employing Yanukovych as its surrogate in Ukraine. Yanukovych's blatant prioritizing of the relationship with Russia, above and beyond what can be considered friendly relations with an important partner, helped turn the Ukrainian people against Russia. Russia, fearing that they had lost their influence in a region important for both strategic as well as ideological reasons, then compounded their initial mistake by seizing the specific territories that were important to it. The result was that from 2014 onwards, Ukrainian national identity, previously torn between an independent and unique stance versus one that emphasized the importance of its relationship with Russia, now decidedly emphasized the former in its outlook. Ukraine's pivot played into the worst fears of Vladimir Putin and more importantly, Russian nationalists. The expansion of NATO into what Putin regards as Russia's sphere of influence prevented him from adequately addressing the status of Russian ethnic minorities, particularly those in the Baltic region. Ukraine, however, was one country where Putin was able to address these issues. Putin portrayed Ukrainian actions, such as the 2019 law that made the Ukrainian language compulsory in public administration, electoral process, education, etc., as a genocidal act against the ethnic Russians. This framing was not factually accurate. One can argue the law was discriminatory, but did not reach genocidal levels. Framing their actions in this light, however, helped redirect Russian national sentiment away from states where Russia could not intervene, such as the Baltic states, and onto one that had strategic significance to Russia and was presumably a weak target, Ukraine. Beginning in the fall of 2021, Russia began repositioning its forces to the Ukrainian frontier, as well as to its ally Belarus, ostensibly for training purposes. On 24 February 2022, Russia initiated the current phase of the conflict by launching a full-fledged invasion of Ukraine. Ukraine, however, contrary to popular expectations, managed to halt Russia's initial assault in 2022. Furthermore, Ukraine, despite possessing significant shortfalls in personnel and equipment compared to Russia, was able to reverse several of the latter's gains. Ukraine achieved these feats both due to its strengths and weaknesses within the Russian forces. In terms of the Ukrainian forces' strengths, Analysts made the error in that they assumed the Ukrainian Army of 2022 was the Ukrainian Army of 2014. Ukrainian forces spent eight years preparing for the exact offensive that Russia launched against the country in the aftermath of Russia's de facto annexation of Donetsk and Luhansk. Not only did Ukraine prepare its defense, but American Western military advisors spent considerable time training Ukraine's officers and non-commissioned officers. This training allowed Ukrainian forces to pursue new tactics beyond those standardly employed by armies derived from Soviet ideology. In particular, this training emphasized individual initiative at the company level and below, rather than relying upon the centralized command directing them from areas removed from the battlefield. Given that the Russian army relied on the latter, this allowed Ukrainian units to exploit battlefield developments faster than their Russian counterparts. Devolving command functions also amplified the other major advantage that the Ukrainian forces possessed, morale. From the outset of the conflict, the Ukrainian people, rather than collapsing as most analysts believe Russia expected, 
instead rallied to President Zelensky and the Ukrainian government. The fact that individual people stood up against Russian aggression amplified the initiative that individual commanders were able to commit on the battlefield due to their soldiers' high morale. What is often missed in military, uh, by military analysts is that military force is physical means multiplied by morale. Morale, however, can be a fraction, as the Russian army experienced in the early phases of the operation. Morale was perhaps the biggest problem faced by Russian soldiers at the start of the operation. Furthermore, once it became known that Ukraine was the destination, many soldiers, including perhaps the Russian leadership itself, thought that the Ukrainian people would greet them as liberators. This belief, as we mentioned, could not be further from the truth. And when it was revealed, it further shattered the morale in the Russian forces and discouraged initiative, which further played into the strengths of the Ukrainian forces. The Russian authorities, furthermore, in their attempt to downplay the mobilization of their soldiers along the frontier, did not provide adequate supplies. As Russian soldiers were not told the true nature of the operation, soldiers themselves could not even provision themselves with adequate gear in advance. Basic essentials, such as winter survival gear, were lacking in the Russian army. So inadequate were Russia's preparations for the war that the lack of adequate personal equipment has remained a problem well into this year, more than a year after the conflict began. The lack of adequate gear also speaks to the miscalculation that Russia made when it commenced activities. It underestimated its opponent and assumed that it would be a relatively quick war. Galiotti, one of the foremost experts on contemporary Russian politics and military affairs, notes that the Russian political and military establishment is designed, in many ways, to reinforce Putin's preeminent position within the political system. Aides compete to present Putin with a variety of options upon which he will ultimately determine the course of action. While this reinforces Putin's control of the political system, it simultaneously means that individuals are loath to present information that might prove displeasuring to Putin. The result is that Putin, most likely, overestimated the capability of his own forces while simultaneously underestimating those of Ukraine. The competition between various aides for influence within the Kremlin, furthermore, has also affected the Russian state's military command and control. This division was not a new phenomenon. Russia had for years created parallel forces to serve a variety of functions. For example, the Wagner Group was an elite, if morally questionable, private military force established to provide plausible deniability for Russian military ventures abroad. Russia's reversals in Ukraine, however, forced the Russian state to deploy it in said country with the predictable result of increasing tensions between the defense minister and Wagner's chief leader, Evgeny Prigozhin. While the end result of that tension, the Wagner group's aborted revolt in June 2023, was not foreseeable, tensions emerged from the outset between the Russian army and the nominal private military contractors. This hindered the Russian forces' abilities to respond and allowed Ukrainian forces to inflict losses upon them disproportionate to what otherwise may have been possible. This was most notably seen at Bakhmut. Lastly, the importance of Russian nationalists to Putin's political base and how it impacts the war can be seen in the forced conscription uh, of, the, of the ethnic minorities uh, within the Russian Federation. Sorry, misplaced page. The conscription was not universally focused. Instead, Russian authorities focused a disproportionate amount of their efforts on conscripting the non-ethnic minorities to fight in Ukraine. While this serves to keep Putin in power, the individuals conscripted do not have the same desire to fight as the ethnic Russians, let alone the Ukrainian forces defending their homeland. This has further compromised the morale of the Russian forces in Ukraine. While Ukrainian forces were able to inflict disproportionate casualties upon Russia in the first year of the conflict, the important thing to note is nothing in war is static. Ukrainian forces, for example, have suffered considerable attrition, particularly amongst the low-ranking officers and non-commissioned officers who made their initial victories possible. The Russian army, furthermore, has adapted to the conflict, and while still not at the level of the Ukrainian army, has considerably narrowed the gap. This development makes external aid even more vital for Ukraine as the illusion of a quick victory, such as what observers hope for in the summer of 2023, are dashed. Unfortunately, the aid provided is proving inadequate. If we're talking about the Western response to Ukraine, 
technology ends up defining the Western perspective on the war. But the foretold cyber offenses and the hybrid strategies ended up being tertiary at best to the conflict. Instead, the war has been punctuated by debates over weapon systems of increasing complexity, as if complexity brings lethality and effectiveness on its own. First with javelins, then leopards and abrams, and now with F-16s, weapon systems have defined a strategic outlook. Rather than attribute recent slowing of Ukraine's offenses to the failure of Western powers to deliver necessary lethal aid in a timely manner, we need to address how Ukraine is being pushed to organize around this technical aid. The problem in the discussion of lethal aid is that it, the United States and other allies insist Ukraine adopt a combination of doctrinal thinking, institutional arrangement, and warfighting ethos the US military associates with these systems. Standing up new brigades and training them in multi-domain operations has been the priority. The result has been a slow advance and high levels of attrition, as we saw in the summer of 2023. Even so, the ability to execute joint operations has become a litmus test. If Ukraine can realize them, they can win. But these systems should not determine the operational model, but support one better suited to the environment. The style of complex multi-domain operations passes for common sense within the United States and NATO thinking, but it is a contingent approach to war. Jointness as a concept is fine, but it has become reified into a specific uh, form hallmarked by decontextualized truths. A trend of applying one operational construct to all cases, rather than considering whatever, whether it is suited to a particular theater and whether one's own forces can execute it well, has been repeated in Ukraine. Military leaders are a culture to specific doctrinal perspectives and a mythology that obscures their ways of using technology. The Second World War is a telling example. In the collective memory of the Second World War, everyone highlights Blitzkrieg and Patton, who admittedly has questionable tactics besides, but allies like Canada fought a less dynamic war, if not equally as effective. In Ukraine, this belief is having two effects. First, a doctrinal mismatch between Ukrainian and Russian forces, which favors the latter, has emerged. More prepared for a parade, per, uh, sorry about that. More prepared for a parade than the invasion itself, the invasion has quickly unraveled to expose what Michael Kaufman and Rob Lee see as Russian force not built for a purpose. But Russian doctrine was built for the purpose of countering a NATO invasion. Command and logistical issues aside, Russia is proving effective at returning to its doctrine which focuses on the contestation of attacks on territory it controls, as we're seeing within the recent summer months. While unable to break out, Russian forces were able to draw Ukrainian forces into a quagmire, just like they would seek to do against a NATO action. In adopting a more defensive posture while short of their stated political goals, Russia is likely working to play to this advantage. Second, Ukraine's military is largely predicated on mobilization and the employment of newly constituted units. This is a far cry from the integrated system of reserve and National Guard units underpinning US doctrine. As in Russia, Ukraine has relied on mobilization to expand its force structure, and this has not been easy. This vulnerability would exist even if Ukraine was already organized, staffed, and equipped to operate within the technologically driven joint force model emphasized by the United States. While Ukrainian forces could adopt this approach, it is costly, complicated, and time consuming that the Ukrainian armed forces have even begun to approximate some of these abilities demonstrates their tenacity. While much is made of how long it takes to train units in the use of complex systems, it must be remembered that it takes decades to develop a force capable of complex joint force operations. The deeper organizational needs of a US style multi-domain operations is simply unattainable under current conditions. We have been here before. Similar efforts were unsuccessful in Iraq. NATO had to take a, uh, on huge swaths to counter ISIS operations to realize joint actions with friends on the ground. This, as we know, is quite off the table in Ukraine. Comparing the role of artillery and air power in Ukraine brings out how this frame produces pressures to adopt approaches ill-suited to the environment. On one side, NATO leaders insist Ukraine demonstrate the essential nature of air superiority. Ukrainian military leaders have also decried pressure from NATO to take on an offensive posture without air superiority, which the alliance would never attempt itself. Russia's inability to achieve air support superiority, however, 
does not undermine their approach. Russia's shortcomings reflected its doctrine as much as the technical and material limitations of its force design. Russia's actions following the invasion have illustrated a move away from complex forms of maneuver tied to their ill-conceived notions of a quick war to one more heavily focused on indirect fire. This is not completely anachronistic, but reflects their conventional doctrine. This is missed by an analytical debate too heavily focused on lessons supposedly drawn from the serious operation issues during the invasion of Georgia in 2008. Analysts have taken a uh, technological advancement and shift to the so-called Eurasimov doctrine, as David Cullen does, as illustrating a fundamental shift in the Russian approach that can be broken open by maneuver. The current war in Ukraine shows the fallacy of this. Russia's air power doctrine borrows heavily from that of the Soviet Union. Air power is used to contest the technological sophistication of NATO and undermine the opposition's capacity to achieve aerial dominance in the event of the invasion of Russia itself. As a linchpin of jointness, the desire to disrupt air power becomes a focal point for Russian doctrine. It's not about winning the war in the air, as that would necessitate becoming more capable than NATO. Instead, the goal is likely to contest air and disrupt joint operations. Ukraine's efforts to achieve aerial dominance, specifically through the provision of F-16s, are actually going to further exacerbate this doctrinal mismatch. Conversely, where lethal aid has been direct and effective is with artillery. Ukraine has been effective in winning the attritional artillery war. Long-range precision strikes from HIMARS have helped in this regard, as mirrored by the Swiss decision to send Ukraine archer artillery systems, which have been essential. While focus had been on the breakout, this attritional approach to war has borne more fruit, admittedly over a longer time frame. Concentrating on advanced weapon systems has produced a difficult geopolitical context. Though Ukraine has received many of the systems it requested, and which are required for joint operations, the timeline for these has been long and disjointed. Even though political pressure has dragged states like Germany and the United States along in providing Leopards and Abrams, the cost-benefit analysis appears weak. Such weapon systems are necessary, but their attrition means the debate will continue. Furthermore, the diplomatic context has created other outcomes. To secure Leopards from Europe, the United States anteed up by providing Abrams. These tanks have only just arrived, but their long logistical tail, anachronistic characteristics, they actually end up operating best on jet fuel, believe it or not, and their inherent complexity means their usefulness is very much in question. It is also not clear that advanced weapon systems will translate to any net uh, benefit on the battlefield, given the doctrinal mismatch they help propagate. All this detracts from more pressing needs that play to Ukraine's strengths. The Ukrainian armies are shortage of artillery shells, and the inevitable necessity to replace artillery tubes has actually received scant political attention. If this amounted to a strictly technical or military question, this might not be an issue, but it is inherently a political one. There are also very real operational considerations at play here. While the deployment of ever more advanced systems has provoked Russia's bolstering uh, around tactical nuclear weapons, an operational approach that completely disregards the law of armed conflict, through a willingness to target civilians, more banal forms of logistical support have not drawn Russia's attention. Logistical trains from Poland, which any moderate reading of the law of war would count as a legitimate target, have actually not been targeted. This is one of the net positives in the current context. Russia's doctrine and material limitations mean that it is either unable or more likely unwilling to disrupt these flows. This takes us to what now, given the current military situation? Given the military constraints upon Russia and Ukraine and the West material support of Ukraine proving inadequate, in some ways, as we have discussed, detrimental, the question arises of what direction the war is heading. Both sides cannot afford a loss. The problem, however, is the maximized objectives of both groups. In the case of Ukraine, its desire to restore all the territory that Russia sees from it since 2014 is, unfortunately, unrealistic. Even if it was possible from a strictly military standpoint, which is increasingly thrown into question given the constraints that Ukraine possesses in terms of soldiers and Western aid, Russia cannot allow a perceived defeat from a political standpoint. Simultaneously, Russia's desire to impose itself upon Ukraine and annex territories beyond Donetsk, Luhansk, and Crimea is a non-starter for both Ukraine and its supporters. Such a result is unacceptable to Ukraine as Ukrainian nationalists 
sentiments have been inflamed by Russia's act of aggression and Ukraine supporters who have tied much of their international credit to halting Russia. Proposals for Ukraine's position as a neutral state are also a non-starter. Individuals desiring an immediate end to hostilities, as well as in the West, have made such proposals. What they fail to note, or conveniently choose to ignore, is that such an action would be rewarding Russia's act of aggression. Furthermore, given the Russian government's tendency to treat international agreements as suggestions, so long as they favor its interests, such a result is undesirable and potentially dangerous in the precedent it sets for Russia and other actors that seek to upset the international order. While one can argue that the international order needs to change from its current Western-centric orientation, pivoting the one that favors overt aggression is not desirable. Instead, in order to look to a likely outcome to the war in Ukraine, we need to look to the past, specifically the Korean War. Most people believe the Korean War ended in 1953. This is correct in the de facto sense. In a legal de jure sense, however, the Korean War has not ended. Instead, what de facto ended the conflict was an armistice, not a peace treaty. This allowed all parties to end the conflict without admitting fault or justness of the opposing claims. Given both sides' intransigence in this war and the maximalist perspectives is the only realistic solution. That said, it is not yet imminent. Realistically, the conflict cannot end until the pre-war boundaries, and by pre-war, I mean those of the current phase, 2014, or sorry, 2022, not 2014, are reached. This would achieve two goals. One, it would allow Russia to save face. Russia, fortunately, was quite ambiguous in its initial goals for the invasion, not even calling it a military invasion, but a special military operation to protect ethnic Russian population of Ukraine. While Russia has now recognized that it is a war, the ambiguity of protecting the Russian people can serve as a way for Russia to claim victory, even if it is anything but such a development. Reaching the pre-2022 borders, furthermore, would likely not make Ukraine happy, but is an achievable goal in the current military situation. Ukraine's capabilities, especially its strength and artillery, are best suited to small bite and hold actions. Ukraine's recent bridgehead on the Dnieper River is a representative of this kind of development. Ukrainian combat capability, however, will likely decline the longer the war goes on. Its recent recruitment issues are indicative of this trend. Furthermore, with the Ukrainian support becoming politicized in the lead up to the 2024 presidential election, there is no long-term guarantee of external support. Thus, the Ukrainian advance culminating in reacquiring the territories conquered by Russia post-22, while not ideal, is at least achievable. So in conclusion, Given that such a development is desired by neither party nor their international backers, unfortunately, a winter of discontent is what we approach as the conflict progresses to the third year of its current phase. Thank you, everybody. Comments? You spoke to the effects of uh, Western support of the Ukraine and how it affected affects the tactics they're taking in the war. Can you speak to, and I don't know if this even has an effect on Russia, but their sort of Eastern support from North Korea, Iran, and China, and whether that has any effect on their tactics or changes their tactics in any way? It's actually been serving to kind of reinforce their tactics. Um, specifically, we know from intelligence reports that there's considerable supplies coming from essentially North Korea, where much of the equipment is old kind of Soviet stock anyways. This is basically allowing them to kind of continue a little bit of an attritional style battle. But specifically, one of the changes that we start to see within this conflict has actually been with drones in terms of their capabilities. Iran has actually been providing extensive drone support to Russia. Uh, this is allowing them to basically target their artillery in a more effective manner. We see both sides actually employing it. Uh, in part, Ukraine's actually been a little bit more successful as they develop doctrinal changes, but it's been able to offset some of the gains potentially from Russia. Russia has actually been running into a major material problem during the conflict, basically having to use old uh, T-55 tanks 
that really shouldn't have a place within the contemporary conflict. So the technology has basically just kind of reinforced their pre-existing doctrine rather than giving them new force capabilities. Thank you. They kind of broaden the scope onto the international community. Uh, we've seen the responsibility to protect principle exercised in Libya, Somalia, Rwanda, Kosovo, but we haven't seen military intervention in Ukraine. Does this mean that responsibility to protect principle is hollow in a sense? And what would it mean if Russia won this war? Good question. Yeah, there's been an argument about the responsibility to protect doctrine has actually been hollow for some time, basically due to selectivity with which it's employed. Uh, we see it basically in many instances where either Europe, the United States, the broadly conceived global north, seeks to try to gain some kind of advantage from it, but in other instances is completely neglected. Um, so in terms of whether the responsibility to protect is basically hollowed out, I would say it already was by this point and kind of Ukraine has further ended up demonstrating it. Unfortunate development, but it's kind of where it's been going. In terms of the effect of the war and the result, do you mean it depends on what the actual outcome of the conflict is? It's still uncertain at this stage. If it ends as I suspect it will, and I could be completely wrong, it's always uh, troublesome making predictions into the future. It will basically reinforce some of the polarity that we're seeing within the international community. That said, that's if it happens how I suspect it does, and that's not a given. So I don't want to prognosticate too much in that regard. Um, I have a question and then I'll come to, to Adrian. Um, thanks very much. It was just an incredibly informative um, uh, talk, uh, great analysis. And I, I just wanted to pick up on one of the things that um, we've been concerned with now over several years uh, at the Institute, and, and that's the, the rise of the, um, the global far right and um, neo fascism, um, which is uh, an issue both in Russia, I mean, one of the key figures of, uh, of uh, a resurgent far right, is, of course, as you know, Alexander Dugin, uh, whose daughter was just, what, about eight months ago, a year ago, uh, uh, assassinated. Um, and that has, and, you know, figures like uh, Vladimir Zhirinovsky, the leader of the so called Liberal Party, um, also one of these, uh, you know, far right ultra nationalist figures uh, in Russia. Um, but Russia uh, embarks on this uh, special operation in part justified, and I think you alluded to this, um, as part of a process of denazification. Um, now obviously this is propaganda, but there's, there's some element of truth to it as well, isn't there, insofar as it's not just the Azov Brigade. Um, I think militaries across the, the global north, including our own military, has significant elements of, uh, of, of the far right um, uh, kind of uh, um, uh, embedded in them. And case in point also is Germany. The security apparatus has some very significant far right actors uh, within it. Um, but there's two things that, that make me quite concerned. The first is in the coalition government, it was formed in 2014, there was members of the Svoboda party, it's a far right party. In the actual Euromaidan movement, there were significant um, far right, uh, there's significant far right presence. Um, and then also you have these, an infiltration or you have uh, quite a, um, a swathe of um, foreign fighters coming into Ukraine, uh, a significant, well, I'm, I'm not so sure, and this would be my question, but it seems that there's a significant uh, component that are drawn from the far right across the, 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 the global north. Um, and this could be something like a staging ground for resurgent uh, uh, far right and neo-fascist right, and um, this is troubling, if it's true. So that's my question. So, yes, there has been, there certainly is actually have been both armed forces elements that we consider part of the far right. I would say it actually goes both ways though. Um, 
in terms of foreign fighters, both within that have been fighting for Ukraine, as well as for Russia itself. Russia actually got in considerable trouble for actively recruiting soldiers in Serbia. Uh, so it can potentially be a kind of a testing ground for this ideology that unfortunately ends up spreading out after the conflict. The other thing I would end up mentioning though is it's also the conflict itself and kind of the tensions it's creating amongst both supporters and detractors is actually leading to the rise of some far right parties even within Europe itself. I mentioned recently Slovakia who's kind of an adamant kind of pro-Russian figure. The kind of resentment and tension as the war drags on is being picked up upon basically elements outside the standard political spectrum, including the far right, to start kind of advancing their interests. So it's an unfortunate kind of domino effect that we're seeing spread out from the conflict itself. Thanks, I appreciated your analysis uh, a lot. Uh, I'm intrigued by your proposal of the Korean War, or the ending or non-ending of the Korean War as a kind of model. And I uh, was wondering if you might expand on how you might see that uh, occurring. Uh, it, you know, is, is that a possible uh, way to go, and what would it take? I think in order to actually reach that point, there's a couple of factors that need to come about. As I mentioned, first is Ukraine reaching the point basically of the pre-2022 borders, because there's no way that, for example, Zelensky could go back to his audience and say that we haven't at least reached this standpoint. There's also going to be a point where the two forces essentially reach a point of kind of exhaustion, where essentially the warfare has become so protracted, you have this significant drain on resources, you have the overall exhaustion of kind of support within the societies as well that is gonna push for such an agreement. As I said, there's, there's a bad joke in international relations that there's nothing so as permanent as a temporary kind of solution. This, if you present it as a temporary solution, people can at least latch on to the idea that we might be able to achieve more in the future. But typically what happens in kind of a situation like an armistice or a temporary agreement is that it ends up freezing the issue and then it becomes so problematic to try to push forward in its aftermath that nobody is willing to end up opening it up. We see this actually play out in 1995 with kind of Dayton Accords, which are basically just trying to halt the conflict within Bosnia. Then nobody really wanted to open it up afterwards and it became basically a permanent agreement. So does that answer the question? Yeah. yeah. Uh, but I want to continue the question, you know, yeah. but it was a frozen conflict before, you know, the recent escalation in 2022, wasn't it? Frozen with uh, multiple sparks in between for, since 2014. There was many instances that were basically conflict broke out in the Donbass. It kind of pulled back a little bit. Now the problem is both sides have so much invested political capital that that can't be withdrawn as easily. If Putin, for example, went back to his government and said that, you know, this war is a failure, Putin's not going to be too long for basically the state. He needs to end up presenting something as a form of accomplishment. An armistice where you get to end up claiming that you protected the interests of the ethnic Russians ends up doing so, even if we both or everybody kind of knows that this was not how it was actually designed to go. So it basically goes back to being a frozen conflict. I know you're saying that there might be potential later on for a potential like restarting of the conflict. That is a possibility. But in terms of wh what can potentially end up stopping it without potential dire escalation, it's basically about the only option we have right now that I can see. And another question, do we have any uh, reliable information on the opinion of Russian speaking population in Ukraine and their potential role in this conflict? We have qualified information with regards to it because there's been difficulty kind of trying to assess. What we do know, however, is that essentially there's been ethnic cleansing occurring throughout the conflict that have been kind of further russifying the territories that Russia has seized. 
and furthermore, trying to end up encouraging migration back and forth in order to fully russify the territories. Essentially, what we're seeing is basically more or less the politics play out in, behind the army front in order to further stabilize it. Um, there is, for example, ethnic Russians that are vehemently opposed to uh, Russia's actions within Ukraine, but Russia is trying to basically use it and pump up this group in order to justify its actions. In terms of the exact numbers and percentages, uh, there's the bad joke about in war, truth is so precious it has to be protected with a bodyguard of lies. The information is so kind of stratified that I don't want to trust too much of it in that regard. Could you speak uh, further towards Russian public morale, particularly in the major cities and the border cities, uh, Sevastopol comes to mind, or Rostov-on-Don? It's actually been kind of stronger, at least from my reading of the sources, and this again is open to contestation because trying to find out accurate information on kind of Russian popular support is incredibly difficult. Um, basically, most of the polls have, are government funded to one degree or another, and the private ones have been shut down over the course of the war. Our indications, though, is that the support is at least stronger than what we would, everybody suspected. And in particular, everybody kind of figured in the aftermath of Prigozhin's revolt that there would be an effective breakdown. This did not occur whatsoever. Um, there's different strains of Russian nationalism, but they appear to actually be kind of unifying, at least beyond, behind Putin at this stage. Furthermore, the kind of demonization that ethnic Russians faced in kind of the aftermath of the invasion and kind of the exclusion further kind of solidified support under Putin by creating an us versus them dynamic. So the support is actually much stronger than basically most analysts would be willing to concede at this point. Thank you. Um, I would like to hear your thoughts about um, what you think. Since with the very big spotlight of social media and um, the online presence of everyone that has based on the war with Russia's like fragile uh, image that Putin is so trying to hold on be like make Russia great again as we might say um, with like uh, the negative um, view that the world has on Russia even with the very limited victories it might have wouldn't it lead to um, future international uh, relationships and its like resentments that even like some of its allies, let's say its biggest ally, Iran, is slowly trying to um, play both sides of the war. Coming, because um, I was there like three months ago and I can say like there have been many ethnic Russians and Ukrainians there side by side, like living together. And both of them are like super sick of the, of the situation. And they're saying that even most Russians are fleeing the conscription. And wouldn't that further damage Russia's real, very fragile image that the world has of it? Yeah, great question. That's part of the reason that I alluded to in the talk that in terms of the conscription, Russia is actually being very selective. Uh, Russia is a multi-ethnic state. Very much so. Russians actually represent a plurality of the population. And Russia has actually been focusing the conscription efforts primarily away from the ethnic Russian population as a way of basically trying to maintain that support. Because there is a recognition that, yes, the people may be behind, but if there starts to be more and more Russian body bags coming back, this could potentially end up undermining the morale. So they've been primarily uh, targeting conscription to the ethnic minorities away from the cities, basically as a way of trying to keep it out of eyesight of the major urban uh, centers in effort to gain support. Unfortunately, I don't see this changing. The most recent conscription efforts seem to be continuing this policy. So it's basically a way of trying to divert attention away from Putin's major support base, which is the Russian nationalists within the country. I think this is a really good question. But I also think that um, maybe it's not uh, quite the case that Russia's image um, solely has been 
tarnished globally. I think that the, um, the Western Alliance, um, NATO and the United States, um, in the global south has come off rather poorly through this conflict, and especially now after the attack by Hamas um, of Israel on uh, October 7th, and then the overwhelming Western response, which has been, to put it mildly, quite one-sided. Um, this has further damaged the standing um, of the United States um, uh, and of the West, countries like Canada, in the eyes uh, of those in the global south who, to just see an absolute double standard here, uh, that you look at the way in which um, the territorial integrity of the Palestinians has been uh, uh, absolutely uh, trodden on um, and negated, um, and see the way that that has been uh, treated in comparison with uh, the Russian invasion of of Ukraine, I think this is a serious thing. As is, and and, and I really like your, your commentary on um, the rise of the BRICS as a counterbalancing force now uh, to Western hegemony. Yeah. So in the case of Russia's image internationally from the conflict, in the when the conflict first broke out, there was a common narrative that you know the whole world is against Russia at this point. It really wasn't the case, to be perfectly honest. In part, there was political issues. Russia's actually made several major ties with a lot of countries over the past decade. The other issue that came to the forefront was the price of wheat. The conflict had significantly disrupted the price of wheat, actually causing it to skyrocket. For many leaders within the Global South, the issue wasn't the rightness of Russia versus Ukraine. It was getting the price of basically grain down to a point that you could be, uh, their people could eat once more. Starvation, there's actually, there's starting to be some studies emerge on the number of people who were killed essentially from the rising price of wheat as a result of the conflict and the starvation it caused. And in particular, the basically uh, to Samir's point, it began seed as essentially the West continuing this conflict and jacking up the price of wheat whether that's right or wrong. Ukraine like, being the breadbasket of the world, especially an important yeah. supplier to the global south of e grain. Exactly, and the, with the conflict perpetuating itself, the fear is that prices are continue, gonna continue to rise and that the reason behind the conflict continuing is Western support of Ukraine. So it's actually, as much as it's been framed as kind of Ukraine, or basically Ukraine and the world versus Russia, it's more the EU, North America, the global north, in Ukraine versus Russia with more ambivalence, I would end up saying, not outright support of Russia, because there's not there's a few countries, for example, that are, but more ambivalence and just wanting the war to end and basically drive down the price of grain once more. And, and NATO overreach, this is something that's very um, uh, pressing uh, for the Global South, particularly post um, 2001. Yeah. And all the mayhem and destruction that followed from NATO. Yeah. Um, how do you think that uh, this war in uh, Russia and Ukraine could tie into other international conflicts, um, such as the Palestine-Israel war, and what uh, consequences that could have? It actually is kind of tied in immediately if in the aftermath. Um, Zelensky almost immediately came out in support of Israel, right from the outset. Uh, Russia has ended up backing actually Hamas uh, frequently and basically its statements. So we see basically the Ukraine conflict or the war in Ukraine basically end up merging into these other conflicts. We're seeing tensions between several of the major powers and it's basically playing out in conflicts beyond their immediate frontier. And so it ends up lapping right into it. Well, I have another question about um, the possibility of a widening of the war uh, where NATO becomes more directly as opposed to indirectly involved. Yeah. You can say what's going on now is a kind of proxy uh, war against Russia via Ukraine, which instrumentalizes Ukraine in a way. Um, but the possible escalation, any attack on one NATO member is an attack on the alliance. And then the possibility of there being a kind of tactic 
tactical nuclear exchange, which has been mooted, I think, during, during the, the conflict, um, and then the possibility of uh, a real escalation to something like um, a global conflagration. What, what are your thoughts about that? Ought we to be concerned about such an escalation? Should we be concerned? Yes, always be concerned whenever there's kind of nuclear weapons mentioned, to be perfectly honest. That said, there's been quite clear from the outset an attempt by all parties to kind of avoid that escalation. As I mentioned in the talk, with the supplies coming in directly from Poland, by most readings of any kind of international uh, rules of war, those are viable targets. Russia's not doing so, though. Why? Because they don't want to end up escalating it to a point that ends up involving NATO and the potential uh, conflagration. They're shelling they, close to the, the, the Polish border, though. They're very close. Huh? They, uh, they're getting closer, yeah. And it's always been, there's been a couple of incidents. Um, for example, there was the fear that when, I believe it was an anti-aircraft missile, actually it was from Ukraine, accidentally landed on the Polish border, that basically Russia was uh, escalating. But from the outset of the conflict, there's actually been the establishment of basically communication lines between specifically the United States and Russia that they can basically warn one another that, like, you know, that wasn't us or was uh, some other party to prevent that escalation. So should we be concerned? Always be concerned when any time nuclear weapons or potential escalation arise. Is it that kind of imminent concern? Probably not at this point. We have plenty of time for lots more discussion. A uh, popular trope holds that um, NATO expansion was one of the direct causes of the war. Is there a possibility for further NATO expansion? What would this mean? I think NATO's going to hold off expansion for a little bit just because of that. Uh, there's been several efforts, for example, by Ukraine to kind of accelerate its ascension. And well, Basically, NATO members have said, yes, we foresee this in the future. They've been very clear not to provide a timeline on that. Uh, I will say it did, or in terms of NATO's expansion, it will actually work to, uh, sorry, let me rephrase. NATO's expansion is probably going to halt for the foreseeable future just because of the potential concerns. It's also becoming increasingly unwieldy. Uh, we see this basically with responses from Hungary, uh, Slovakia as well, basically cutting off basically the unified front that NATO has relied upon for so long. We also saw the problems created when basically Sweden and Finland were trying to join NATO and Turkey was moving to block and basically uh, halt things with regards to the ascension. So it's almost reaching such a size that it basically becomes unmanageable. So expansion I don't see in the foreseeable future. Well, we were talking about this earlier in terms of SFU hosting a, a NATO field school, and um, it's so interesting that I'm part of a, a list uh, that is uh, an academic freedom and freedom of speech list, and there's an insistence on institutional neutrality, no, no, no grandiose statements about the war in Palestine, please. Um, but there's no sense that um, it perhaps stretches institutional neutrality to host a NATO field school, arguably. And I've looked at the syllabus, and there's no Noam Chomsky, and there's no uh, uh, John Mearsheimer, um, which is interesting. I mean, how critical could such a field school be? And then that means academic freedom is being pushed a bit, because academic freedom does entail some degree of you know, critical exchange. Um, uh, of, of perspectives, of variety of perspectives included in the curriculum, and I don't know. Um, but this raises other questions that, that um, was alluded to here earlier in terms of um, just driving ethnic Russians back into the fold, which is, as you pointed out um, uh, uh, early on in the talk, the kind of vilification of, uh, of, of ethnic Russians. You had a series of cancellations of you know, Russian performers and artists and writers and so on. Um, part of, you know, cancel culture now at a geopolitical level. This is quite interesting. And we see this at um, 
really an almost unbelievable level now in terms of any kind of expression of Palestinian solidarity. If you express Palestinian solidarity, you are a quasi-terrorist, or you are, in, in a sense, um, uh, somehow um, in support of, uh, of, of Hamas, which is absolutely not the case. It might be the case in certain situations, but you cannot make a blanket sort of claim here. So I, I'm just wondering to throw some light on this. It just seems uh, so bizarre. Um, my take would be that, and we have a, a, a class here uh, um, uh, on you know, a Nietzsche uh, class that, that's come, come by, and somebody also from Humanities 101, within which we're reading uh, Machiavelli and the whole question of mercenaries in, 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 in one's forces is, is really quite um, fascinating from that perspective. But one of the things we've been really focusing on in Nietzsche is the um, opposition between good and evil as central to um, you know, Christian morality and how dangerous that can be. I would submit that we can see how precisely how dangerous it is in a very complex geopolitical situation like the Ukraine. Um, but it seems that from so many of our political leaders, uh, the media, um, academics, uh, there are only two categories within which to understand this conflict, and that is good versus evil. Uh, I wonder what your thoughts are. I would say just in nearly every war, distinctions of good and evil are highly problematic. You, there certainly is one side that you can argue might have certain kind of like legitimate arguments, but the very nature of war itself causes you to basically pursue actions that generally most people would consider evil, taking other lives, things like that. So my perspective would be, yes, you can certainly kind of have kind of a perspective. For example, I'm opposed to Russia's aggression in this, but that doesn't mean you should uncritically accept every single point of the basically uh, side opposing Russia. Just the whole, for to the point of kind of the cancel culture that developed with uh, ethnic Russians, it actually just bothered me from a strategic standpoint, because these were groups that you could have actually ended up weaponizing against Putin in order to try to destabilize things a little bit. But in the terms of just creating a clear uh, polarity basically between them, this meant that that opportunity was lost. So instead of having that critical engagement of how can basically say you're actually opposing Russian aggression, how can you basically challenge this most effectively? The polarization, the embracing of rhetoric, the echo chambers that end up being created in social media and the news mm -hmm. really end up creating a missed opportunity to basically absolutely. check this early on. No, absolutely. And you know, if you're uh, an op opponent of the war and mm -hmm. you recognize the, the horror of uh, Russian aggression, mm -hmm. um, a uh, formation like Pussy Riot is not your enemy. They're your mm -hmm. friend. Yeah. But somehow this blanket um, uh, attack is, is, is very problematic. Also, you could say that, well, what, what was going on prior to October 7th in Israel? Massive protests against Netanyahu. Um, and so well, what was going on here then with the attack? There must have been some sense that there will be a counterattack, uh, and it will be vicious. Um, and there must have been some kind of calculation about what would then ensue, right? And how many deaths would, would, uh, would occur and, and so on. So to just say that Hamas is the resistance just negates all of that. And it becomes a very simplistic kind of framing, um, which actually permits more cancellation, right? Yeah. Um, and so the complexity of politics gets reduced and we're left with more morality and moralism. Hmm. Right? Yeah, it often gets missed. That there's a tendency to regard war as a video game, where basically, yeah. you know, I'm maximizing the personal strengths of this particular unit, things like that. Yeah. We all there's video games still that exist today like that. Yeah. That said, what people often forget is that basically war, politics, and society are all intertwined. War ends up directly ref uh, reflecting politics, reflecting society as a whole. And you need to understand the dynamics of society and politics in order to see how war is going to end up being waged. Uh, in terms of basically Israel-Palestine, I would just end up saying that one of the things that basically seems to be lost in the narrative right now is that 
Israel's responding exactly how Hamas wanted them to. Absolutely. And we actually have documentation right. that they're trying to end up pulling them in. Yeah. But because of the lack of critical analysis on the topic, that is being completely missed. That essentially this was the goal of Hamas from the outset, and right. it's being missed in the overall narrative. Well, back when Hamas was, was elected, yeah. um, the PLO leader, Yasser Arafat, had been, had been sort of holed up in, in his compound precisely by the Israeli government, which was, was, was supporting Hamas. And it wanted a non-partner in dialogue. It didn't want a dialogue. Yeah. So this, is get, this gets uh, conveniently forgotten as well. You know? And other, other such moves to support uh, this kind of uh, uh, a movement. So are there any other questions, comments? Adrian, did you, did you have your hand up? Did you want to come back? Oh, the question over there. I, I, so should, I should have introduced Adrian, who's um, our incoming J.S. Woodsworth chair. We're very delighted to have him here. Another question? This one asks lots of questions, <laughs> and really good ones. Um, so uh, what, uh, what action uh, do you think that individual civilians, especially in terms of uh, cancel culture and that kind of thing, uh, what action can individual civ civilians in the international community and in Russia and Ukraine itself um, take to sort of de-escalate or, um, I don't know the right word, but uh, to further help the situation? This is going to be a plug, but take more humanities courses, yeah. to be perfectly honest. Um, no, the, the critical thinking, the media literacy, basically the textual analysis that basically we need in order to basically analyze things in an age of misinformation is unfortunately lacking and basically de-emphasized within the current curriculum. We need to re-emphasize these skills in order to basically challenge because Technology is becoming more pervasive. It's becoming more easy to end up manipulating information. And we have, was it deep fakes, I think they're called now, the images that you can end up constructing it. There's one, there was, I think there's an alleged attack on the White House that basically went up for a couple hours before it was proven. We need that kind of critical analysis, and it only comes uh, basically from the arts and humanities. So encouraging that. Is, as I said, is going to be my plug for today. I, I think this is probably, unless there are any further questions or comments, a, a good um, note to end on. And I think also, uh, not just humanities courses, because then you have to, you know, um, you have to register and 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 uh, show up and do the work, which is good and important for students here. Um, people can, of course, audit. Uh, if you're a non-credit student, you can come and audit and participate, which is great. But come to more institute events. Um, we have a certain perspective, um, for sure, but we also feel, uh, as an academic institution, um, compelled to open a space for perspectives we might actually disagree with, and quite, uh, quite strongly, but we still feel that they should be aired. Um, and speaking spe specifically here about war, violence, um, speech is the antidote, I think, to violence. We've gotten to a point um, in our civilizational discussion, in at least the, the West and the global North, where we're coming too easily to equate speech and violence and the harm that words might have. And in some cases, yes, we must, um, I think, allow for this, but the all too easy, Overinflation of harm and the all too easy association um, of speech with violence unfortunately opens the door to actual violence. Because if we're not talking with one another, what else are we doing? Well, I'll let you, I'll let you try your own conclusions. Um, anyway, so uh, this has been a great evening, James. Thanks very much. Well, thank um, you for having me, and thanks for everybody showing up. Talk. Here. Thank you all for your questions and comments. And um, look at that, the food has arrived and there's a cash bar. So stick around and we'll continue the conversation. And we hope to see you again. Thanks very much.